Tonight's presentation is a new dawn asteroids Vesta and Cirrus revealed. So um, the dawn mission um, was the first mission by NASA to orbit two main belt asteroids, Vesta and Cirrus. It was launched in September 2007 and arrived in, uh, at Vesta in July of 2011. It orbited the asteroid for a year, studied the surface features, and then departed Vesta in September of 2012 and rendezvoused with Cirrus in 2015. And then the end of the mission occurred in late 2018. And here's an artist's conception of the, uh, the spacecraft. The spacecraft utilized a unique ion propulsion system. <clears throat> it used <clears throat> the fuel xenon, which uh, accelerated ions. So with Newton's third law, for every action equal and opposite reaction. So the xenon pushed here, and then it pushed the spacecraft forward. And then here's the artist uh, conception of um, Vesta, and here's Cirrus, and then the uh, solar panel stretch 64.6 feet, so pretty large. So there were three primary instruments, the uh, framing camera, which like it says, framed the, the big, uh, the asteroid and uh, the features, the visible and infrared spectrometer. Excuse and that me, revealed surface Gregory, huh? your slides yeah. are no longer full screen. Could you do that again, please? Oh yeah, sorry. That. Is that it? Okay, uh, so visible and infrared mapping spectrometer reveal the surface minerals, and then the gamma ray and neutron spectrometer, the grand, determine the elements that make up the asteroids. And the spacecraft will also measure the gravitational field of each asteroid. And then asteroid 4 Vesta <clears throat> was the fourth asteroid to be discovered in 1807 by Olbers and is the second largest asteroid measuring. You know, it's unfortunate. We don't think in kilometers. I've read a lot of the primary literature that was all published in science and uh, everything was in kilometers. So I had to convert it to miles because I don't think 525 kilometers doesn't mean much to me, but if you say 326 and a half miles, oh, all right, that means something, right? And I didn't know how to convert the weight, but the weight is just unimaginable anyway. So Vesta appears to be dry vault and differentiated with surface features ranging from volcanic basaltic lava flows to deep crater in its southern pole. <clears throat> and then you can see here, a um, this is a Hubble Space Telescope view of it. And you can see here the overall shape. And here's where this um, where this deep crater is. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. <clears throat> Success. A donor. <clears throat> My throat's going. Donner successfully arrived on July 16, 2011, and began uh, studying it August 2011. And um, <clears throat> this was the first image obtained from, look at that, 3,231 miles away. And this is really cute. The set of three large craters, these three craters, have been named the snowmen. Doesn't that look like a snowman? <laughs> I mean, that looks like a perfect snowman right there. <clears throat> so Vesta, like I said, is a large asteroid, 326 and a half miles. The, this is really interesting. The surface is an igneous crust <clears throat> with overall relief. It goes down 13.9, almost 14 miles deep and almost 12 miles high. Isn't that amazing? So there's a lot of... There's a lot of variation in the um, in the uh, texture of the uh, asteroid. Uh, rotational period takes 5.3 hours to rotate mass. Orbital period takes 3.6 years to go around the sun. These are the temperatures here. 
So it goes from negative 307 Fahrenheit to our nice and warm negative 0 0.7. And the surface gravity is 0.22 meters per second squared. And, you know, uh, Earth's is 9.8 meters per second squared, 32 feet per second squared. So it's very little gravity. And um, th this was really fascinating. As, um, asteroids were discovered to have moons associated with them. And the very first... Uh, asteroid to be imaged was Gaspar. That didn't have a moon, but the second one that was ever imaged was uh, Ida. And this one was determined to have an asteroid and it's called Dactyl. Isn't that cool? It was discovered by the Galileo spacecraft, which was actually heading to, uh, to Jupiter. <clears throat> and, and the moon is only 19 miles long. So moons have been discovered on these asteroids. One of them, Sylvia, is 175 miles and has two moons. So there are no moons orbiting uh, asteroid Vesta. We would have seen it. This Dawn spacecraft would have seen it as it came in. Um, global dichotomy of the hemispheres. So there's three. There's the northern hemisphere, the southern, the equatorial region. And uh, there's a lot of dichotomy, a lot of differences. The, no the northern hemisphere is old and heavily cratered surface. The southern hemisphere is smoother with two large basins. Okay, we'll talk more about these in a bit. Along with a massive mountain, equatorial region exhibits deep troughs. And uh, the craters of Vesta, named after the Roman goddess Vesta, and uh, th there's always a theme and, and features named after festivals and towns of that era. And the snowmen have been officially named Marcia, the largest, Calpurnia, and Minusia. So the Dawn spacecraft confirmed a large impact basin covering Vesta's South Pole. The basin is named Rhea Silvia and is 310.7 miles in diameter and dated to 1 billion years old. Uh, the local geology is outlined in the um, diagram and it's consistent with an impact of about 31 to 62 mile diameter object impacting the asteroid. So here you can see it right here. And uh, actually, there's two basins, which I'll talk about here. One is right here, and the other is right there. And then you can see the different <coughs> floor material, outer troughs, ejecta, rims and slums. Second basin is here, and then a central complex. Okay. And then uh, surprisingly, another base, uh, basin was discovered originally called Older, Base, Older Basin, it's now Veninia Basin, and is 2 billion years old. So here, in, so in, on the South Pole, you have two huge basins, okay? And uh, the largest is Rhea Silvia, and the smaller one is Veninia. And notice Veninia kind of intersects the dotted lines, goes underneath Rhea Silvia and partially overlaps, okay. And they and five other bases have been discovered at larger than 93 miles. Uh, two major impacts and shock waves rippling through the uh, asteroid. Think of it, there were two huge uh, asteroids that impacted this early in the formation of the solar system. And then this sent, uh, um, this sent a lot of um, shock waves rippling through the asteroid and then the troughs, that we'll talk about in a bit near the equator and the northern hemispheres opened up due to these southern bombardments. So you can kind of see here a little bit, these are the troughs, these are the equatorial troughs. Okay, so the northern hemisphere is typically older and heavily cratered, this is the northern hemisphere. These are the troughs right here, see them? Very, very, very long. The northern troughs are 242.3 miles long. Look, Look at that, that's really large. And 23.6 wide and uh, have a muted topography, slumped edges, infilling is evident. Were formed during the Veninia Basin impact. And then I mentioned this before, the, the snowman craters now have official names, Marcia, Calpurnia, and Minusia. And uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the Marcia crater the largest bottom one is uh, very young. And uh, you can see ejecta blanket. See the ejecta blanket from all these craters here. Very, very smooth. 
Okay. And then the dark crater in the center, which is this one. And then there's also some other dark ones there and there and there. Oh, I'm from New England, so I should say dark. These dark craters <laughs> above the center are currently under debate. So um, this has been solved, but it, either two things, it either came up from volcanic uh, eruptions in the past, volcanic origin, or it was um, due to uh, impact by a type of uh, asteroid called um, a carbonaceous uh, chondrite impact. And uh, here's a carbonaceous chondrite meteorite, so you can see it's very jet black, okay? <laughs> So the equatorial region is moderately cratered and characterized by long troughs that cover two thirds of the asteroid. So here's the equatorial region, see more troughs, okay? And uh, these are 236 miles and 9.3 miles wide, not as wide as the Northern ones. And they have flat floors with a steep scarp wall. So a scarp is just a cliff with a steep slope. Okay, that's a geologic term. So the equatorial troughs form from the Rhea Silvia impact and note the difference in albedos. Albedo is just uh, the amount of uh, reflectivity in something. Uh, a mirror would have 100% high albedo and a charcoal briquette or uh, carbonaceous chondrite would only have four or five percent albedo okay it doesn't reflect much light that's why it's black okay so that's all albedo is it's the reflectivity so this is brighter than this part and then um scientists are confident that these troughs were in the north and in the equator would due to the rhea silvia and venenia impacts in the south pole and then 3d uh shape model of uh, look at that the hubble space telescope had had the shape really well, look at that. That was 2007. And then here's the, the shape here. And then you can even see this central mountain here, see it? And we'll talk more about here. And then here's the impact. You can see it from a different angle. There's the impact and you can kind of make it out here. See, so the Hubble did a pretty decent job of, you know, giving us a fuzzy little look at, um, at Vesta. So um, uh, this, this I mentioned earlier, the, the topography, um, its radius relative to its size. So um, it goes down 13.9 miles and up 11.9. So it goes down like 14 miles and up 12. So this makes it a very hilly and slope intensive environment. And the impact craters range from fresh to highly degraded. And they have kind of strange shapes, elliptical, V-shaped, some have a sharp rim and a slump. See here, you can see a lot of slumping. Here's a sharper rim. So the, the craters are not like the ones you see on the moon. And then the Southern Hemisphere shows the impact basin, Hubble Space Telescope. And, uh, that, and, this, and here it is, the central mountain, look at this, um, is 124.3 miles wide and at the base and rises 13.7 miles from its base. It's twice the height of Everest on Earth and slightly smaller than Olympus Mons, which is the largest mountain on Mars. So isn't that amazing? So on a little 326 mile asteroid, you have, you have a mountain that goes up 13.7 miles. That's huge, man, <laughs> twice the size of Everest. So, okay, the HED Association. This refers to meteorites, okay? And uh, HED refers to howardite, eucrite, and diogenite. So these are meteorites, achondrites, thought to be fragments that were blasted off the surface of Vesta. Thus, we have pieces of Vesta here on Earth. And, and not only that, you can purchase uh, Vesta in real estate on eBay. It doesn't come cheap, <laughs> but you can see it. And uh, <clears throat> so let me just talk about three basic types of meteorites. You have stones, irons, and stony irons. Really simple, stone, iron, and stony iron, okay? And then, and then um, 
One thing that surprises people when I talk about meteorites is most people think meteorites, most of them are, are iron type because that's what you see in the museums. And these are the easiest ones to find because they're nickel iron, so they respond to a metal detector and a magnet. But iron's only 6% of all known meteorites. The stones are the 92%. Okay, and when I first started collecting meteorites, I collected a lot of irons. It took a while for stones to grow on me, but now I, I love the stones. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then the prettiest ones, these I call the supermodels of the meteorite world, are the uh, stony iron palisites. And uh, this is olivine, which is uh, gem gray peridot. And I'll talk more about olivine in a bit. But stones are two types, chondrites and achondrites. And chondrites are these little small vesicles here that form during the formation of the solar nebula. And achondrites meaning lacking these chondrules because they were melted and reprocessed. So these are the three types of meteorites from, um, from Vesta called uh, eucrites, Diogenites and Howardites, okay? And um, Eucrite, does anyone speak French? Do you, does anyone know how to pronounce that? I, I like no Juvenas or, you know, for, how it would be pronounced in French, but this is, uh, this is it here. So that's, these Eucrites uh, are found, I, I'll talk more about this in a bit. So these are the Eucrites and some of them are a little bit white and this one's called Milba Lily from Australia. And this is Johnstown. This was actually seen to fall. These two were seen to fall. And then the Howardite is this one. And that was um, actually found in 2001 in Morocco, Algeria. And uh, what's cool about, um, how do we know that, that they're from um, Vesta? The pyroxene dip. So Vesta's surface is basaltic rich in the minerals pyroxene and plagioclase. And pyroxene exhibits a major band, absorption band here at 0.93 and one at 1.97, okay? So what scientists have done is they ground up specimens of these meteorites, breaks my heart. Those are the solid lines, okay? And then, uh, they, and then they took reflectance spectra from Vesta, so they recorded the light that bounced back from Vesta, okay, at specific wavelengths. And look at the look at the matches. Isn't that fantastic? You do not get this type of matching with asteroids and and other types of meteorites. So it's really really great. So this is, and then the pyroxene dip is, it, my wife really loves uh, cheese and crackers. So it sounds like pyroxene dip, anyone? Tastes great on <laughs> cheese and crackers. So eucrite mineralogy. So here I also have a collection of thin sections, which are sliced uh, uh, thinner than a human hair. And they're like microscope slides you saw in biology of tissue tissues, but instead they're rocks. And uh, note the fine grain texture in, indicating rapid cooling of the rock on the surface of the asteroid. So eucrites are, I found a, a nice easy way to remember this fun way. So eucrites are on top. So think of it, ET, the extraterrestrial, ET, eucrites on top. Okay, so they're on the surface of Vesta. And uh, <clears throat> this is really cool, the needle shape minerals are plagioclase, whereas the larger ones are pyroxene. So these are pyroxene, and then these littler ones here are plagioclase. And then uh, this is a twist polarizer. So these colors, if you twist it 180 degrees, they'll change. But I, I put the polarizers where you got the, the best color coordination here. That's only seven millimeters across. I took this picture, by the way. And uh, here, uh, this is a Johnstown diogenite, which is this one. And this is a uh, coarse polymic breccia. Breccia just means rocks that are smashed together. And monomic means it's the same minerals, okay? And these are the, it's the mineral orthopyroxene, also called hyperstein. And here you have class, see clasts. Here you can see one, two, three, four, see it, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 
11 is like 12 class, you may be 13 there. So uh, that's what it is. All these were smashed together and, uh, and uh, cemented together. And then I thought of a nice way. So dia so Eucrites are on top, right? Diogenites are down deep, DDD. Diogenites down deep, Eucrites top, okay? And Howardites <clears throat> uh, are impact brecciated mixtures of Eucrites and Diogenites. So if you take a Eucrite and Diogenite, smash it together so they all stick, okay? Then you get a Howardite. And this is a horodite here. And notice you can see the white part here. See, this white is from the eucrite. And then this part here, the uh, greenish, is from the diogenite. See that? And then this black here is a carbonaceous. You can see it right there is this carbonaceous chondrite type of material. So... Eucrites, ET on top, diogenites down deep, and howardites are just smashed up mixtures of the top two, eucrites and diogenites. Okay, so the South Polar Basin, origin of the Vestoid family of asteroids. So here's a great view of this mountain. See, you can see it really popping out here. Isn't that beautiful? Look at that. That that mountain is... is um, what was it, 13.7 miles from here, from the base all the way, twice the size of Everest. That's amazing. And then this whole thing here is, goes off the picture, but, you know, this is all 124.3 miles in, in length. And then here you can see these are the equatorial troughs here. So you can see how an impact here would send shock waves and form these troughs, see, as the rock would melt, would you know, the shock waves would go like that and then form these, these troughs, okay? So the large impact on the South Polar Vesta would have excavated a large amount of rock into space that would become the Vestoid family of, of, mete of asteroids and ultimately the HED meteorites. So th now I'm gonna talk about how the HED meteorites actually got to Earth, how pieces of Vesta actually got to Earth, okay? So more than half of Rhea Silvia's ejecta was lost into space, two to 4% of the total volume of Vesta. Wow, so that's a lot. So uh, this thing excavated two to four, that impact excavated two to 4% of the total volume and um, large fraction ejected into space. Okay, so this is the most, um, this is the most difficult to understand of this uh, lecture. So I want to go through these slides quick, then I want to backtrack and go slowly, and then we'll stop for questions, okay? So asteroid Vesta location in the main asteroid belt makes it an unlikely candidate for delivery of meteorites to Earth. So Vesta is located here. A asteroids form uh, they don't just occur anywhere in the asteroid belt. A lot of people think, you know, oh, they're just anywhere and everywhere. They're not, because uh, what ends up happening is the orbit of Jupiter, which is huge, and Mars, which is not, causes what's called the resonance, which I'll talk about in a bit, and kind of constrains them in certain fixed orbits. And so you have uh, you have um, a large concentration here, and then you have a gap here. This is the three to one resonance, and then another large concentration here and a gap here, and another gap there, okay. I'll talk more about this. So scientists have discovered a cluster of small Vesta-like asteroids, three to two miles, with albedos and absorption features similar to Vesta, the pyroxene dip. So this is how we know that these that these asteroids are from Vesta. So by 2005, over 5,112 Vesta-type asteroids have been discovered. That's a lot. And there's obviously a lot more. And then an orbital resonance occurs when orbiting bodies exert a regular periodic gravitational influence on each other. So the concept, think of a child going on a swing. When you're in resonance, the child is like this. When if you give the nudge too much, right? You start going like this on the swing, right? Now you're not in resonance, okay? <clears throat> so the orbital resonance greatly influenced the gravitational influence of the bodies. And then the Yatarsky effect is a force acting on a rotating body in space 
caused by thermal emission of photons that carry momentum. So thermal re-radiation exerts a drift and ultimately changes the, uh, the orbit of an asteroid. So uh, small asteroids like four inches to six miles are most affected by this. So here's the asteroid orbiting, here's the sun. So think of it, half of it is in sunlight and half of it is in darkness, just like the earth. And then there's re-radiation into space. And this re-radiation acts like a rocket thruster slowly moving the asteroid in its orbit and it drifts inward, okay? And then what happens is orbital resonances occur when two bodies exert influence on each other. And then resonances create orbital areas of instability. These gaps are called Kirkwood gaps. And then asteroids embarking upon these gaps via collisions or Yatarsky leave the asteroid belt and they're transferred into Earth crossing orbits. Okay, so, <clears throat> so basically, what we're saying here is that Vesta is located here. It's not anywhere near this Kirkwood gap, which would, that, think of the Kirkwood gap as the escape hatch. If an asteroid gets in the Kirkwood gap, it's thrown out of the asteroid belt, okay? And then, um, and then there's several that have been discovered here. So as long as the asteroids are in these nice areas here, see is where Cirrus is located and Eros and some of the other asteroids. Vesta's right here. As long as the child is swinging nicely, okay? And then what ends up happening is the Yatarsky effect slowly takes an asteroid and nudges it slowly, slowly, okay, or a collision. But since these things a lot further than they appear here, okay? It, the collisions aren't as likely. The Yatarsky effect is probably a lot more, um, has a lot more influence. And so what happens is <clears throat> you, you're getting a nice thing. So if something gets too close here to this Kirkwood gap, that's the area of instability. And so that's when the child will go like this and get thrown off the swing. And when you're thrown off the swing, you're thrown out of the asteroid belt and you start heading toward uh, Earth crossing orbits. And that's how the, uh, the HED meteorites get here, pieces of Vesta. So I'll stop for questions. So any questions? This is the most complicated thing to understand here. If anybody understands the concept of resonance better and can give some examples, that would be great. No questions? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so Vesta as a differentiated protoplanet. So th this image here shows what I talked about before. Remember, it goes down, the blue indicates you're way down at minus 14 miles, and the red means you're way up here, 11.9, 12 miles. And then here, the spacecraft also measured the gravitational influence too, the gravity. So by combining these data from these two images, scientists came up with this model of how asteroid Vesta would look. And, it, and it's inferred to have an iron core 70.8 miles in radius. Isn't that amazing? So Vesta is just like the Earth. It has a crust. Okay, plutonic just means volcanic rocks and basalt. Uh, mantle with olivine, okay, and then a metallic core of iron nickel. So, and that's, and that's you know, the iron nickel asteroids and the palisades come from here. And then the HED and the chondrites will come from here, okay? So uh, that's... So by combining data from the topology and the gravity, we get this, this um, model. Okay, so the dark matter is, is confirmed to be carbon. Remember this dark material here in this, uh, in this crater, this is called Cornelia Crater. Well, it was determined to be uh, the spectra of it matched that of clasts in the HED meteorites, which were carbonaceous 
in nature. So the, it's actually this type of, so it's dark carbon clasts are, are not from inside the uh, inside Vesta, but they're outside from impact from carbonaceous chondrite type asteroids. And actually most asteroids are actually this type of asteroid, this carbonaceous chondrite type of asteroid in the asteroid belt. Okay, missing pieces. So scientists were perplexed because they couldn't find olivine in, uh, in um, the southern hemisphere. So here, this should, these two impacts here should have excavated a lot of olivine, which is the mantle. And uh, so... Okay. So can you see here? Isn't that beautiful? What you're seeing here, like stained glass, is olivine. This is actually an olivine diogenite, okay? So th th this is uh, what was missing, all right? And scientists were, were shocked to find out that they were looking in the wrong area. This was a logical place to look in the Southern Hemisphere because this excavated a lot of mantle. All right, remember two to four percent or so of all the volume of Vesta left because of these two impacts. But it was actually found uh, in the northern hemisphere in, in this crater. So these bright regions here were confirmed to be olivine from the VIR visible infrared spectrometer in Belicia crater. Okay, and the olivine was confirmed to be of endogenous origin. Okay, and proposed mechanism, large impact, uh, incorporate large blocks of diog diogenite rich and olivine rich material into eucritic crust with uh, subsequent impacts exposed in olivine. So remember, eucrites are on top, diogenites down deep, and then the howardites are brecciated mixtures. So the, this is the olivine that we've been looking for. So the pyroxene dip revisited. Remember, I talked about the pyroxene dip. So uh, so these HED meteorites so show right here at 0.93 and at 1.97 microns, you get this absorption from pyroxene. And look at this. Now, now look, look at this. This is, this is really beautiful. I love this graph because look at this. This is this is the same graph, but this is the solid lines are ref are reflect a reflection from um, asteroid Vesta itself. Okay, traveling millions of miles from the asteroid belt to Earth. Here, you're only a few hundred feet uh, above <laughs> a few hundred miles above the uh, the asteroid. So notice these things are exactly the same, but they're deeper. See, here's the 0.93 and here's the 1.97. Isn't that beautiful? So the pyroxene dips are equal to the one on Earth, and they're even deeper because you're directly above it. You're not getting any sort of you know, extinction of the light you know, that would travel millions of miles. So this is really beautiful. So uh, mineral diversity in, in, uh, in uh, Vesta here, like I said, eucrites are on top, diogenites down deep, and this is just showing different parts uh, are more eucrite rich and other parts are more diogenite rich. So that's all that's basically saying, okay? You can read all this for yourself, but the, that's basically what it's saying, that the southern region is more diogenite rich because of the Rhea Silvia and Veninia impacts, and the northern hemisphere is more eucrite rich. This is more the northern hemisphere, this is more the southern, okay? And then hydrogen on Vesta. So the grand gamma ray neutron detector uh, looked for hydrogen. So when you're looking for hydrogen, looking for water, think of water as HOH, H plus OH minus. So you're looking for um, water and then notice you had the most water here, uh, 400 micrograms per gram. The red has the most. So it was basically along the equator where you had the most water. 
okay? And uh, they actually didn't find liquid water or, or ices like that, but um, they, they found that, you know, the, these carbonaceous chondrites up to like 20, 20% water. If you were to heat this, water would come out of it, okay? So it's, it's uh, believed to be trapped within um, a source of hydrogen in the surfaces due to these carbonaceous chondrites that collided and uh, left, left the, the water content here. The water is in this clay called the phyllosilicate. Okay, so that, that ends um, asteroid Vesta. So any questions before we go on to <clears throat> asteroid Cirrus? How are we doing on time? Okay. As we started a little bit late, um, you may have Greg? to unmute yourself to by pressing the microphone if it's got a slash read through it to uh, ask a question if you want. If Greg? Not. Yes. Yeah. Of all the meteorites found on Earth, mm. what percentage does anybody think came from Vesta? Oh, oh they, they have that number. I, I don't know it offhand. It's only maybe three, four percent, because there's chondrites and achondrites, and chondrites are the more common of the 92 percent, and the HED right. are only a small, uh, a small um, number of the achondrites, there's albrights, mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's a lot of other types of achondrites, so it's just a few percent, but, it, but it's significant that we actually have you know, pieces of asteroid Vesta. Isn't that cool? You know, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing that we do, you know. And they're available on eBay. <laughs> so any other questions? Just a comment. Um, okay. you, you holding up the um, display, you know, the, uh, yeah. the article works fine. It brought it into focus, and it was just where it needed to be. Oh, okay, good. Well, <clears throat> now I'm actually seeing myself. I miniaturized them. Right, but now of I course I can't you're see myself going. with it. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, no other questions. We'll move on. Okay. So onward, to asteroid okay, series. So full screen again, please. Oh yeah. All right. Sorry. All right, so it left on September 4th, 2012, and arrived at Cirrus uh, early 2015. Look at that, it took three years to get there. And then uh, began orbiting, and the adventure continues. So here's a nice artist conception. There's Vesta, there's Cirrus, and it's heading to Cirrus. And then it's interesting, uh, these two asteroids cannot be any more different. Remember, Vesta we talked about is differentiated, is rocky, dry, and bright, has an iron core mantle and crust made of basalt, source of the HED meteorites. Cirrus, we're going to talk about, is icy, wet, and dark. It is expected to have a rocky core and icy mantle and dusty clay surface. So notice here, notice how different they are. See, there's no iron core in Cirrus. Okay, so asteroid Cirrus. Um, it was discovered in 1801 by Giuseppe Pilaggi, Piazzi, um, largest asteroid, 590.3 miles, okay? And, and this is fascinating. This weight represents 30 to 40% of the total mass of the asteroid belt. So over a third, 33% is a third. So over a third of the total mass of the asteroid belt is in one asteroid. Isn't that amazing? I didn't know that. That is, that's just mind blowing, I think, you know, think about it. And then uh, the orbital takes 4.6 years to go once around the sun. And the International Astronomical Union reclassified asteroid Cirrus as a dwarf planet at, um, in 2006. This, I don't know why they did this because I can see Pluto because Pluto is actually the nearest Kuiper belt object. And, uh, but Cirrus did, doesn't clear its own 
area. It's right in the asteroid belt. I don't know why. They, probably because it's so large, but, you know, still. I, I like calling it asteroid series. <laughs> and then dwarf planet Sirius does not have a moon. Okay, so both of these did not have moons, being as large as they are. And, and little Ida had a moon, you know, which is interesting. So Sirius is a C-class carbonaceous, this type of asteroid with a dusty clay-like surface evidence of water, okay? And scientists suspect a thick water ice mantle. And then this is fascinating. Uh, the uh, Herschel telescope detected water on dwarf planet Sirius. Here's the, here's the asteroid laid out and then Right here, they detected water in these regions here. When it comes close and it, and it uh, and the water vapor escapes at 13.2 pounds per second, isn't that amazing? And then Cirrus, and then what's in the colder part of the orbit, no water escapes. So it's really interesting. So there's a lot of water on Cirrus. And notice Vesta was bone dry, okay? It didn't have any water on it at all. And this is the first time water vapor has been unequivocally detected as Cirrus. Okay, so dawn approaches. This is at a distance of 8,450 miles as it's coming in. So this is our first kind of high resolution look. And it was named after the Roman goddess of agriculture. And the surface is very dark and cratered. This is actually very, this is actually increased the contrast. Cirrus actually is this dark, okay? But if you saw it this dark, it would just be one black ball, okay? So they, so scientists have increased the contrast so you can actually see stuff there, all right? But ju just remember that it's actually this dark, okay? There's several bright areas, uh, some smooth terrains and some chaotically fractured uh, terrains. And then look at these two bright areas here. Mysterious bright spot. Guess what? Aliens. Check YouTube. There are videos stating that these bright spots are serious. A dude on Alien City. Aliens are living here. It's just too much, you know. But uh, but uh, they're unique in the solar system. They may be ice salt or a combination. The brightness indicates recent exposure, and they've been given names: Cerulea Facule is the largest, then. Vinalia Facule is the, the next smallest ones. And then uh, they did, this one's been determined to be 30 million years old. And this is an Akatur crater, which is uh, 92 kilometers, 57.2 miles. Remember, a kilometer is 0. 0.6 miles. So it's, uh, so it's just a little more than half a mile. So think of it that way. <clears throat> So the bright spots are not alien. So the, the <clears throat> scientists initially thought they were magnesium sulfate uh, hexahedrite or Epsom salt that just soak your feet, but a new analysis indicates they're actually sodium carbonate. And uh, this represents the largest concentration and an impacting asteroid could not have delivered them. Uh, so a thermal or, thermo hydrothermal origin within Sirius itself. So this makes sense since there's a lot of water in Sirius, right? It came from the interior and the water would be brimy, would have salts in it. And then it would deposit the salts. And as it came up to the surface, it would sublimate. Remember sublimation is going from a solid to a gas, carbon dioxide, dry ice. Everyone's seen dry ice in uh sublimates. You have a block of dry ice, you'll never have liquid dry ice on the table. It just goes into the atmosphere. But it goes, notice it flows down because it's denser, heavier than air. So it doesn't, it doesn't rise up, it goes down. And uh, <clears throat> so the impacting asteroid. So, so think of it, the water came from underneath the surface of Cirrus, had salts in it. The water sublimated, it went from a liquid uh, solid to a gas, okay? And then left the salts behind, okay? And so that makes a lot of sense. And then this crater dome is only 4 million years old, quite young geologically, okay? And then Hulani Crater, this was named um, 
Uh, this one uh, shows evidence of landslides. This is enha color enhanced. This shows, uh, the bluish shows ejecta material. Isn't that beautiful? And then uh, what's interesting about this crater is it has a polygonal shape and I didn't see it at first. See, notice these are very round. It, it has like a benzene ring shape, six-sided figure shape. See it? Like that, like that, like that. See, so it's not really super round, so that which is unusual, okay? And this is 21.1 miles. And then Oxo Crater, uh, this one's a smaller crater. Um, how big is this one? Isn't that right there? Oh, six mile, yeah, six mile crater. And uh, this one has a, a slump. There's a slump they're talking about there. And then they, they were they detected liquid water here and water was detected on, on the crater. So here's water ice lab spectrum. And then here's the water ice spectrum here on uh, by the Dawn VIR spectrometer. Notice that that is like an exact match. And then at these specific wavelengths too. So it's just amazing. So I'm gonna talk about the the three largest craters here. First one, Kerwin Crater is right here. It's the largest, 176 miles. It's uh, shallow and lacks a central peak. The central peak would be here, but no, it's a crater, 9.3 mile crater. So probably destroyed the central peak there. And then it's relatively old because you could tell it's overlapped by other features and these crater walls are not very high and everything. So, you know, Planetary geologists look at all this morphology, all this geology here, and they're able to tell relative ages of craters. So you could tell that's a much older crater. And then uh, Yolodi is the second largest, 168 miles. And it, you can see a series of canyons here running through it. And these have been named Samhan Katina. And then uh, here's another one, Ravana Crater, third largest, 101 miles. And this one has a central peak right here and then unexplained ridges here running through it. And then down to 78 miles and the bright deposits here on, the, on these crater walls. Okay, and then the surface here, uh, five miles above and in uh, so five miles um, kind of below the surface in indigo. Okay, so the the indigo, the dark blue here, violet is five miles below, and red is five miles above. Remember, Cirrus is a lot more. Cirrus went thirteen point nine miles down, and like what. 11.9, 12, 13 down and 12 up. It, it had much more, much more difference in its features. And then here's where these craters are. You can kind of see where they are relative to each other. Here's Yolodi, Irvana, Akatur. This has the two eyes <laughs> where the aliens reside. Uh, Dantu Crater, Kerwin, here's the largest crater here. And uh, Haolani Crater. So we talked about these in a little detail. And then the, uh, the missing crater problem. Um, Cirrus is covered with small craters and none is larger than 175. So scientists are wondering what happened to these craters. So they found these large scale depressions called planete and the largest is 500 miles Vendemia planete and there's other ones. And then what happened is it's kind of an easy explanation. Since there's so much uh, volatile, such as water, it flowed on its surface, covering a lot of the craters. And then the, and then the smaller impacts occurred later. So basically water kind of covered up a lot of the craters and, and, and that's why there's not as many craters as you would expect. Ahunamans, not an alien pyramid. So this was another alien. Uh, so as uh, the as the Dawn uh, spacecraft approach, uh, this thing looked like a pyramid shape. Okay, and then uh, but as it got closer, it was actually a mountain with bright material slopes, and um, on the steepest slope, three miles high. So it's three miles high, and its highest slope at two point five. 
and it rises higher than uh, Washington's Mount Rainier and Mount McKinley, so Whitney. So here's uh, Ahuna Mons. And then this is fascinating. Ahuna Mons is a cryovolcano. I never knew this existed before I started researching this. <clears throat> Cryo, remember, volcanoes erupt molten rock, lava, right? Well, cryovolcanoes erupt the frozen slurry of salty ices. So imagine that. So instead of molten rock, this is erupting uh, salty ices. That is so cool. And then uh, Cladius, the Saturn crossing, uh, <clears throat> Well, uh, is known also to have cryovolcanoes. <clears throat> and then um, the mountain is quite young. Um, and then um, disappearing volcanoes. So just like we had disappearing um, craters, now uh, scientists are thinking there's only one cryovolcano on Cirrus they're probably more in the future, uh, in the past. So, you know, two possibilities that this is the only one, or there were more, but they would, um, but they were, you know, destroyed somehow. So viscous relaxation is the mechanism of flow of solids over time. So based on computer models, it would uh, flatten out at a rate of 10 to 50, 50 meters every million years to render cryovolcanoes unrecognizable after hundreds of millions of years. So since this is only 200 million years old, it hasn't uh, had enough time to deform. So that's the, so that's the theory. There were probably more of these cryovolcanoes on, on um, asteroid Cirrus, but due to viscous relaxation flow of solids over time, they were all, they were all, uh, wiped out. So landslides, three different types of landslides here. Uh, type one around large, the, the type one occur at higher latitudes, type two at mid latitudes, and type three uh, form uh, at lower latitudes. And then this one's funny. This one they said looks like Bart Simpson. <laughs> Isn't that neat? Actually it looks more like Homer to me, but Either way, so you can read a lot of this for yourself. Landslides occur more at the poles and the equator, ice effects. Um, and then they talk about here, yeah, 20 to 30% of craters, six miles, end up with some sort of landslide. And then hydrogen abundance, water on dwarf planet Cirrus. So, um, this confused me when I first read it, but it's an inverse relationship. See, see this dark blue here? They're looking for water. So think of water as H plus OH minus, HOH. So they're looking for hydrogen, the H uh, of water. And, <clears throat> and they're looking at it um, in the North Pole, okay, because this doesn't get a lot of sunlight. And so counts decrease with increasing hydrogen concentration. So blue... <clears throat> has the lowest neutron count. So low neutron count means high hydrogen concentration, okay? And red means the lowest, which is down here. This is more reddish, okay? So that's all that's basically saying. So scientists have identified 600 craters in the northern region that never receive sunlight, okay? And then um, Water confirmed in uh, hemisphere, northern hemisphere craters. So a lot of these are very cold, never gets above 110.9 Kelvin or negative 260 degrees Fahrenheit. They're very chilly and often little ice turns to vapor. So, <clears throat> so here they detected the uh, presence of water here from the spectra. And then these are the ones that never receive any um, sunlight here. Okay, so the interior of Sirius based upon gravity data. So um, look at this, as, as the spacecraft orbited Sirius, it, it, it was able to track subtle changes in the motion of the spacecraft to an accuracy of 0 0.1 millimeter per second. Isn't that amazing? I mean, you're orbiting the, the asteroid and you can detect changes in the motion of the 
spacecraft going around it to point. You know how small a millimeter is? Look at a millimeter. It's so tiny. Imagine a tenth of that. You need a microscope to see a tenth of a millimeter. I mean, that's just amazing. And, and then this is the way they detected you know, the, the um, gravity of Cirrus, too. And then uh, Cirrus, I mean Vesta. And then Cirrus is in hydrostatic equilibrium, I mean the gravity squeezes it into a nearly round shape. Okay, and then gravity indicates is a partially differentiated body with a rocky core overlaid with 30 to 40 percent water ice by volume. And the gravity is 0.27 meters per second. And on Earth, it's, it's 9.8 or 32 feet per second. But th this is the thing, a thin, dusty outer crust, rocky inner core, and then water ice layer underneath it. So there's a lot of water ice down here, like, like a solid ocean. Okay, so a ancient ocean remnants. So uh, Ceres was believed to once cover with a global ocean. So the missing water is probably locked up in the planet's crust, which is right here, okay? And, uh, and then it's made up of ice salts, salts and hydrated materials and clathate hydrates. I love scientific names, clathate hydrate. What the heck is that? It's a crystalline combination about as dense as ice, but a thousand times stronger. So it's basically, it's basically water in, in a certain crystalline structure. Look it up and uh, you, you'll see the structure of it, but it's, it's as dense as ice, but a lot stronger. And then traces of water may still be deeper inside here, but we don't know. And then graphitized carbon, carbon forms, graphitized carbon forms when carbon is heated to high temperatures in the absence of oxygen. So throughout its history, car carbon uh, filled meteorites have bombarded it. And so the solar winds charged particles uh, change the carbon into this graphitized carbon releasing hydrogen and then leaving this uh, carbon here. It's low albedo, it doesn't reflect a lot of light. Okay, organic compounds discovered. Um, organic compounds, so carbon bonded to itself, okay? Uh, there's three forms, carbon bonded to itself. There's graphite, which forms hexagonal plates which slide over each other, okay? And then there's diamond, which forms a tetrahedral, okay? And then there's buckyballs that form a soccer ball kind of shape that are hollow C60, C70. That was only discovered in the mid 80s too, <laughs> uh, the buckyballs. But organic carbon refers to carbon bonded to hydrogen, oxygen, C-H-O-N, carbon bonded to hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, CHON, C-H-O-N, and then also phosphorus and sulfur. You can add P-S to that too, but usually most of it is C-H-O-N, okay? And um, so the occurrence of organic material due to the delivery by impactors more than high, so it's believed that it actually came from impacting here. So purple shows low abundance, and this is the high abundance here, uh, the orange and yellow of organic compounds. And then um, scientists favor, favor the intrinsic since organic rich is admixed with carbonate and ammoniated phyllosilicates that are endogenous to the dwarf planet. Oh, okay. So these actually, I, I said the wrong thing. This actually came from within the planet because since this is a carbonaceous chondrite type of meteorite, the, this has a lot of water in it. So the organic uh, compounds came from this. This meteorite, by the way, is the Murchison. This is the famous one that has the amino acids, the fatty acids, the sugars, the the uh, the uh, DNA nucleotides, adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine, uracil. I mean, it's amazing all the stuff that's in here. Okay. So this is a treasure trove. This is a very um, academically important meteorite. Okay, so here we have um, the organic uh, compounds are within this 3.3 to 3.6 uh, micrometer spectral region. Okay, and it's uh, the, this methyl, methylene, 
ammonia hydroxyl and carbonate here. They couldn't identify exact uh, molecular molecules, but the, see, here's the Murchison here, and here's the Avuna. They kind of match at this 3.4 micrometer. And then uh, close meteoritic matches to dwarf planet Cirrus. Uh, see, Cirrus isn't as tight as the um, as the HED meteorites are for Vesta. So here's Cirrus here, and you see here's the Vuna. This is a, it's a very fragile one, so I keep it in a membrane box here. Okay, so laboratory spectra measured at 2.7. Uh, match the similarity, but not at other wavelengths. And uh, here's, these are from my collection here. So these are the two meteorites that are the closest. And if you look carefully here, there's, there's little white uh, salts on this Ivuna meteorite, which is cool, but they're calcium and magnesium sulfate. And remember, they, it was calcium uh, carbonate, so. It's not the right salt, but the fact that there are salts on it is significant. And so in so conclusion, um, Dawn spacecraft ran out of the fuel hydrazine on, October, on Halloween and November 1st, 2018. And that's what's used to point the thrusters. It couldn't orientate itself or anything. So it'll remain around orbit on Cirrus for many, many years, but it can't send back any data unfortunately. So that's it. And the mission is over. So it's been over since November 2018. And uh, so any questions? Look at that 69,000 images taken, <laughs> you know, and 132 gigabytes of data. Wow, that's amazing. So yeah, Greg, yeah. Uh, so the feeling is that the Murchison came from this asteroid? It's unknown which asteroid Murchison right. really came from. But right. this, uh, the, the, the Murchison, this is what they call a, a CM2 carbonaceous chondrite, okay? C stands for carbonaceous, M stands for, Mag for Miguel, which is the, um, which is the parent, uh, which is the first meteorite of that type. And then see all these chondrules here? That that the two means well defined chondrules, okay. And then if Vuna is a C1, this doesn't have any chondrules. See, I don't want to take it out of this membrane box because it's uh, see, this is isn't that cool? So it's um, so that's that one. So these two are the closest meteoritic analogs to Cirrus, and then the HED. You know, Eucrite, Diogenite, Howardite, uh, Vesta. This this association is much firmer, much more written in stone, so to speak. You know, it's a much more well defined than than the, than this. Okay, it would be. Yeah, it would have been great. And yeah, and oh, actually, I didn't mention the uh, right here asteroid. Benu, did I mention that? No, I didn't. Okay, but um, there's actually a spacecraft that can't that touched down on a carbonaceous asteroid called Bennu mm -hmm. that uh, is coming back to us now. Should be here in about two three years, and then Raigu R Y G U something like that. That was a Japanese mission and. They collected five grams of material, and that's already back on Earth. Came back uh, like in October 2020, and they're analyzing it now. I can't wait to read the scientific literature, see if they find amino acids and stuff like that on that asteroid intact, you know? So that, that should be really cool. I want to so. see this with my telescope. What magnitude are we looking at? Oh, what, uh, Cirrus and Vesta? Yeah, are they, are oh, they um, visible? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 they're visible. Usually maybe 10, 9, 10, 11, they're, right. they're, kind of, they're pretty faint. 
and you, you can't distinguish it from a star. I, I haven't even bothered or tried. You would have to take like astro photos one night, wait, take the same field another night, see if it moved. Same way Clyde Tamba on Pluto, you know, that would be the only way to really, to really do it, you know. But yeah, it, it's very, very faint. Stellarium or the Vest sky is, soft. Huh? Vest is 8.1. That's the same point. Well, that's a lot brighter, yeah. Yeah, so that one's a lot easier and a lot bigger to see. And Sirius is actually 8.0. Mm. Oh, wow. It's got a fair oh, oh, so they're a lot brighter than I thought. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's same surprising direction. as dark as it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's Sirius, okay. yeah, as dark may, as it is. may have a better albedo than we expect, you know, so... Mm. Asteroids will move across your field if you watch them far long enough. But, you know, unlike Pluto, which you do have to use some, you know, images over periods of time. But since these are on the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, you got a better chance of seeing some action. Oh, yeah, it, it, it would be fast. Or even an occultation. Right, right. And yeah, maybe I'll give it a shot one day. I'll... <laughs> You know, now with the go-to scopes, you can really home in on it and yeah. see if you can see any difference. Yeah, Greg, the um, the volcano you were showing that's on Ceres. Is yeah, that, the cryovolcano. Is, is the, yeah, the cryovolcano. Is that active or or is that what? Is, is is that an active volcano still? No, I don't think it's active. No, oh. it's uh, okay. actually. Uh, let's see. There it is. That's a computer model of it. That that's the actual photograph of it. Yeah, no, it's not active. Not nothing is active. Okay. Here, yeah, no, it's not. But you can see that. It, yeah, it's not active at all. Oh. But but it's cool that you know it erupts salty water ice. <laughs> I think oh, I, yeah. imagine that yeah. happening on Earth, you know, rather than than lava, right? Yeah. Yeah, kind of cool, you know, when you think about it. It really is, you know. But the Earth would have to be super cold to keep, you know, the ices and all that frozen, you know. Sure. That's the thing, you know. Hmm. And it would sublimate anything that came to the surface yeah. immediately. Yeah. Yeah, it would supplement. Yeah, it would sublimate. Yeah, and plus the atmosphere is not what it is on Earth either, so it would sublimate. Yeah. So they're, they're two fascinating asteroids, and it was a very successful mission. I mean, each orbited for a year, you know. And so do you know the third largest asteroid? They wanted to visit that, but it wasn't in the orbit at the time. Pallas mm -hmm. is the... Yeah. Oh. So, so there was some controversy whether Pallas was second and Vesta was third, but when they got a really good reading of... Um, Vesta, it was larger than what they have for Pallas. So, you know, but who knows? If you're right up against Pallas, that might be, you know, but it's it's really cool. Hmm. And um, so so there, there are a asteroid missions, you know, Bennu's coming back. We went to that Raigu. And then yeah. there's one that's being launched in 2022 called Psyche for us oh. and this is really cool this is a metal asteroid no one has ever seen a metal asteroid i think it's going to land like 2026 it's going to arrive there and it's going to orbit and take pictures you know it's not going to take a sample but can you imagine a metal asteroid every asteroid we've seen are all you know rocky you mm. know like stone meteorites we've never had never seen a metal asteroid like how would a crater look like on a metal asteroid think mm. about it no would it Chris even is, have crater? no chris it's huh? not the death star yeah the death star yeah. I, I was thinking you more know. rama if you've ever read that book yeah oh. <laughs> so I, I mean i yeah. We can't even imagine how that would be, you know, and they were thinking, so I've read some articles that are thinking it might be a mesosiderite type of meteorite or a palisite type of meteorite because they found a lot of olivine in certain sections. So it's a really amazing. And then they're seeing a lot yeah. of nickel iron, the spectra of nickel iron. They're not seeing a lot of like pyroxene or carbonaceous material, a lot of rocky stuff. They're seeing all metal. Yeah. 
So it's really cool. I mean, that, that, I, I can't wait to see that. <laughs> you know? yes. Greg, I've got a question about Vesta. Uh, yeah. since, since it has a, it's, it's, you know, much smaller than series, but it's got a metal core. Is, is there a theory of origin, like it was blasted off a planet by an impact, you know, uh, something that might result in it having, having metal in it like that, or, or is there oh, some um, theory for that? No, it's, um, oh, where's my thing? It's, uh, it's what they call a differentiated asteroid, which means as it formed, just like the earth, um, what is that? Right here. So as it formed, right, the heavier stuff sunk to the bottom and the lighter stuff came on top. That's what they mean by differentiation. Mm -hmm. So plutonic or volcanic rock, when it came to the top, and then any any iron that was let that was, you know, on the surface would slowly make its way down to the center, and you would have, you know core, mantle, and crust. Make sense? Yeah, I was just wondering. I yeah. would assume that would be an indication it must have been quite hot when it formed. Yeah, it yeah, it was, it was, yeah. Uh, series. Right, yeah, 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 that's true. It was, it was very hot. Well, just like the Earth, yeah. And then series, yeah, formed under cooler conditions, right, because it's a carbonaceous type and then the, this these meteorites are a lot more fragile too these these are a lot more rock solid because they're volcanic rock so think of a volcanic rocks very solid and this is more of a clay type of rock so clay is a lot sure. you know softer and less dense you know than than a uh, volcanic rocks yeah. you know, like granite yeah. Sure. So. I just want to it's, it's it's interesting because it, it just you know I don't know if the picture is necessarily accurate as far as how the proportions but it seems to have a decent right. sized metallic core for right right for well they 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 figured um uh 71 in radius by uh, this is how it was figured right here by looking at the uh, the elevation, the topography, remember it goes almost 14 miles down and 12 miles high, and then as and then as it circles, remember it can measure changes to the spacecraft 0.1 millimeter per <laughs> per second or something, right? So that's how it's able to do the gravity. So here you have less gravity in the blue, and here you have more gravity here. So you have a lot of gravity here, very little gravity. So, so I don't know how they do it, but you know, computers do it. You don't do it by by hand, you know. But computer modeling, combining this data and this data, gives you this. Okay, so okay. that's the bottom line. Now, how that was done is a PhD thesis for someone, <laughs> I'm sure, right? Sure, sure. So, it's very interesting, though. Good presentation. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I just scratched the surface. You know, I, I outlined all the primary literature. A lot of this was all published in science during that time. And I read, I read all the hard, uh, hardcore scientific literature several times and outlined it. And I'm trying to wrap it around my head, you know. And once you read it a few times, it starts to make sense, you know. So. Greg, I have a question, a follow-up yeah. question regarding Vesta. Yeah. Um, you mentioned evidence of volcanic activity or flows, and I was wondering if that could right. be um, from um, tidal forces in a liquid mantle induced by other bodies, or would it be from the bombardment when it was Yeah, formed? probably the, yeah, yeah, probably. Remember what I said, diogenites are down deep, right? Eucrites on top, diogenites down deep. So uh, it's been determined... So you can kind of see here these bombardments and here you can kind of see the troughs up here. See, so it makes sense. Something smashes the bottom. You can see the troughs there, see them? Mm -hmm. So you can see how shock waves would be sent through this and, you know, and heated, heat the rock and, and all that. And the shock waves would go through and as it 
harden, these troughs would become permanent. And you have two of them. You have the, the larger Rhea Silvia basin and the smaller uh, Veninia basin. So you had two. So one of them was responsible for the equatorial and the other one was responsible for the northern troughs. Thank you. All right. So, yeah, really good questions. <laughs> You guys, you guys really understand. How about the resonance thing? Does that make sense with the child on the swing, right? And then once you, everyone experienced that as a kid, yes. right? You know, somebody gives, they want to be nasty and they give you a push. You start going like this and, you know, it's easy to get thrown off. So that's what happens. Once it hits a Kirkwood gap, it just gets thrown off. All right. And it does it by either collision, collision, the asteroid or that Yatarsky effect where, you know, it's orbiting and you're getting so, and you're getting a slow, slow push over millions and millions of years. See? So that's all that Yatarsky effect. It's named after the discoverer. Yeah. I don't think I can look at a child's place at it ever again without thinking of the Kirkwood <laughs> between the two. The Kirkwood gas, yeah. <laughs> the kid's going to get yeah. thrown off. <laughs> the Kirkwood gap. <laughs> off without space. without try, trying that to see if it'll you, you can make them uh, go all wobbly. But of course, yeah. we all did it as kids, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You oh, want to yeah. be nasty, so you just give it a little spin and it just goes. And it's really weird because you try to get yourself centered and you can't. The more you try to get yourself centered, the more you mm. start going even more. It's it's you, you're not in resonance anymore. That's it. There's no way to get back. <laughs> so. Excuse me, sir. What are you doing in the kids' playground? Or oh, I'm just preparing for a talk I'm doing on <laughs> resonance. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Mr. Kirkwood, I presume. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a very good point. Well, it's a nice analogy. It's a nice analogy. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. you know. Yeah. If I didn't have that analogy, I don't think you'd understand resonance as much, you know. All right. Well, thank you. Let's all give uh, Greg a nice round of an ASGH applause or a reaction <laughs> button with a thumbs up or the applause, whichever you feel like doing. <laughs> oh, great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Greg, you're welcome. Uh, thank back you. Here anytime. <laughs>